If you want to rise above these toxic people in your life, if you want to not be defined by them, if you don't want to be dragged down by them, ask yourself, what sets you apart from the rest of the world? What is it about you that makes you essential in every relationship that you have, in every situation and circumstance that you have? You are not brand X. Well, hello, hello, it's Dr. Phil, and you are back in Fill in the Blanks. I really hope that you've been thinking about what we have been talking about so far. We are talking about toxic personalities in the real world. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing a review because you've had lots of time to be doing that on your own time. And if you do want a review, then you can go back and listen to the first part of the last several podcasts. You don't listen to the whole thing. I do a little review at the beginning of each one. Now, rather than do a review, I'm just going to do a quick outline. You know that we've been talking about toxic personalities. We've talked about narcissism. We have talked about borderline personalities. And we have talked about antisocial personality types or what you sometimes refer to in your life as psychopaths or sociopaths. It's kind of the same thing. Sometimes the word psychopath is used to describe those that are on the more serious end of the behavioral continuum for antisocial personality. And we're talking about those people that don't have the ability to feel remorse. We're talking about those people that get aggressive. They weaponize all of these things that we've given a voice to. I've been talking about these things because I've heard from so many of you, and I've been getting such great feedback from all of you. Thank you so much for that. I've gotten such great feedback that I've asked each one of you to contact at least one person to share this with. You know, that's how I wound up doing this, by the way. I never had any intention of being on television. Just a personal note here. I never had any intention of being on television. I was in the litigation arena, never gave an interview, never wanted to give an interview, never had any intention of being on television. I represented, from a trial science perspective, a lot of really high profile individuals and entities. And one of those, as you probably know the story by now, I represented Oprah in the Mad Cow case up in Amarillo. The way I wound up being on her show is she said, I've made a commitment to my viewers that anything I find in my life that I think has made a real difference, I'll share with you, whether it's a hairdryer or somebody I meet or a strategy or whatever, If it's made a huge difference in my life, I'm going to come and share it with you. I was very flattered when she said, Dr. Phil McGraw made a huge difference in my life. I was in this trial and I really lost myself and he gave myself back to me. He was very straight talking and didn't mince any words and really gave me a wake up call at a time that I needed it and gave myself back to me. He didn't tell me what I wanted to hear, and it wasn't easy to hear what he had to say, but it was at a time I needed to hear it. We were in the foxhole. We were behind enemy lines, and they were coming after me. Talk about a redistribution of wealth. They wanted to take what was mine and split it up among themselves, and I had no idea why I was there because I hadn't done anything wrong. He gave me a wake-up call, and we prevailed. We prevailed because we dealt with the truth, we were not in denial, and we applied ourselves to the challenge at the time. Be essential. As a mother, you're essential. You do things nobody but you can do. If you work somewhere in an office, cultivate a skill that if you're gone, there is a missing element that they can't get by without. And maybe what you do is you become the best utility player there. You're the one that can fix that damn copier. You're the one 
that knows how to reset all the breakers in the building. You're the one guy that is willing to get up on the roof and get the air conditioners working. You're the one guy that knows the code on the computers that gets the accounting program working. Be that person that knows a lot of answers nobody else knows, and don't tell everybody everything you know. Be essential. And be unique in your knowledge. That makes you essential. Now, I'm talking about strategies here. I'm talking about strategies for getting ahead. Because what if, in this image that I'm talking about, you decide, I want better than what I have. I want more. And I don't care what your currency is. Everybody has a currency. And everybody's currency is a little bit different for them than it is the person next to them. Now, what's currency? Well, money, you know, monetary currency, that's real obvious, right? But even why people want money is different. Some people want money because of what they can buy with it. Some people want money because it represents that the world values them. It's how they keep score. It's not what they can buy with it. I mean, look at Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett lives in Omaha, Nebraska. He lives in a house that is very modest, very middle class. He's lived in it since he didn't have a lot of money, and now he's got billions and billions of dollars. He still lives in the same house. He still drives the same kind of cars. Money to him is not to acquire material things. Money to him obviously represents something else. It's a way of keeping score, and maybe it tells him he's winning. He's accumulating more than someone else. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. But ask yourself, what is your currency? You need to know that. It's terribly important that you know what your currency is. And we're going to talk about that some more next week as well. But it's important that you understand when you decide what your image is, ask yourself what is unique about you. What do you know? What can you do? What is your skill set? What is your personality characteristic that is not common, that nobody else knows? And then when you apply it, when you get in the game and you use those essential skills, how do you keep score? What is your currency? That's the only way you're going to know if what you're doing is working or not. Maybe your currency is a closer walk with God. It's a spiritual experience. That's okay. It doesn't have to be about money. It could be your children being successful and happy and fulfilled. That's a great currency. Being closer to God or whatever being you refer to as that being in your life, whether it's God or something else that you feel closer to, that you feel fulfilled, whatever your currency is. Maybe you're to the point that you're not working for rent money anymore. Maybe that's not what's important to you now. Maybe you're past that. You know, Maslow says, that we have a hierarchy of needs. And, you know, first is survival. And until we have that covered, we're not interested in much else. But when we have all of these different things covered, then we start thinking about actualization, where we start thinking about helping other people, giving other people. Maybe you're at that point where you want to define your uniqueness in what you can do for other people. I'm just saying, I'm not trying to tell you what your currency is. I'm asking you to define what your currency is. That's what's terribly important for you to know. And once you decide, okay, I know what my image is. I know who I am. And part of that image is the right to set up boundaries and get these toxic people out of my life. It doesn't matter whether they meant well or not. They're not working for me. It's not helping me in the pursuit of healthy goals. These people, maybe they'll work for somebody else. They don't work for me. Our chemistry isn't right. We don't click. Maybe they're just bad intent people, 
and you damn sure need to get rid of them. But you have the right to control your relationships and get people out of your life. That's part of your image. Control your relationships. Some people say, oh, I don't want to talk to this person because when you say hello, it's going to be an hour. You know what? If that's true, you're not running your own life. Because you should be able to say, hey, it was good seeing you. Sorry, I can't visit right now. I got to go. And they go, oh, well, and get offended. Well, then let them get offended. If you need to go to pick up your kids, you don't need to hide in a broom closet when you see this person coming because they yammer on forever. Take control of your life. Don't hide. When you see them, say hi. They go, oh, oh, I'm so glad to see you. I need to tell you something. Hold that thought. I don't have time to visit right now. I need to go pick up my kids, so I will see you later. Control your own relationships. Don't be a victim. That's part of this image I'm wanting you to own. Take control of your life. Part of your image is you have the right to set boundaries. You have the right to control your relationships. You have the right to get these toxic people out of your life. That's very, very important. That's part of your image. Part of your image is deciding what it is that's unique about you. Part of your image is deciding what your currency is. And then once you know those things and you say, okay, he wants me to star in my own life, what's my plan? What's my plan? Don't go through this life winging it. I'm not saying not to be spontaneous. I think being spontaneous is great, but you need to have a plan. Let's start fresh. You can be thinking about Omicron or whatever it is, or you can decide, you know what? I don't know what all that's going to bring, but what I do know is I'm going to have a plan. I need to recognize that small differences accumulate across time. And at the end of a month or three months or six months, they add up to some big results. You don't need to leap tall buildings at a single bound. You just need to make small changes day after day after day. And to do that, you need to have a plan. So what's your plan? What is it you want to accomplish? What is it you want to achieve? That's very, very important that you decide what your image is, you decide what it is that's essential about you, you know what your currency is so you know how to measure success, and then you have a plan and you take specific action towards a known outcome. I'll talk to you more about that next week, but I want you to at least start to contemplate having a plan. And you know, I said that one of the things that you need to think about in managing your life is not telling everybody everything you know. You don't need to tell everybody your plan. You may have people in your life that would sabotage your plan if they knew what it was. I had a great example one time of a young woman that worked in a law firm, and she was a paralegal. Let me tell you something about paralegals. I worked with a lot of lawyers in some of the biggest firms in the world. Some of the most brilliant men and women lawyers that you could even imagine paralegals made them successful. Paralegals, like nurses are to doctors, paralegals are to lawyers. They're the ones that organized the files. They're the ones that knew where all the bodies were buried. They're the ones that knew the documents backwards and forwards. They're the ones that made those men and women look brilliant in court. There is always a great team around somebody that's really good at what they do. With doctors, it's nurses. With lawyers, it's paralegals. With me, it's my producers. They're the ones that really know the details. They're the ones that study these guests. They're the ones that manage them ahead of time. They're the ones that put all this together. All these things I'm talking to you about right now, 
my producer for this podcast, Lafern, has put all this stuff together. She's got me outlines here of stuff I've told her I want to talk about. There are always people that are really good at what they do and make others look brilliant. And this paralegal was the best of the best. She had heard about a job at a bigger law firm in town that was looking for somebody to lead the entire paralegal group. That law firm had over a hundred paralegals and they were looking for somebody to oversee all of those paralegals. She was in the running for that job and she was so excited about it. And she went to lunch with some of her fellow paralegals and she just was bubbling over telling them about all of this. I saw her about a week later. And I said, how's it going? What'd you hear about the job? She said, I didn't get it. I said, you're kidding me. Because I thought for sure they would be idiots if they didn't hire her. And I said, if they just not made up their minds? She said, no, they made a hire. I said, who did they hire? And she said, they hired the girl that sits right across from me the woman right across from me in the paralegal office. I said, how did she even know? I talked about it at lunch. That woman listened to her talk about it at lunch. She went back to her desk, called over there, made an appointment, went over there, took her resume, interviewed for the job, got the job, knocked her out of it. She wouldn't even have known about it if this particular individual had not shared her plan. Now, was that an evil thing to do, or was it just her taking advantage of the situation? Well, I don't know. I don't know what she said to him about this woman. But I do know she didn't even know about that job until she shared her plan and told her about it. Keep your plan close to your vest. You don't know who's listening. At some point in their life, they feel like, I am one step ahead of being found out. I'm masquerading. I'm reading one page ahead in the manual of everybody that I'm leading. And I'm just masquerading. You would be shocked to read the research of how many people in this life feel like they're masquerading that they just have an appearance of competency, they just have an appearance of being prepared to do whatever they're doing, but they don't really feel like they're adequate to do it. And if you feel that way, don't feel alone. I'm telling you, everybody feels that way at some point in their life. When I went to graduate school, One of the things we had to do was to go do an internship in residency somewhere. We had to go and spend a year at a psychiatric hospital somewhere as an intern. And my internship was at the VA Medical Center in Waco, Texas. It was a 1,200-bed psychiatric hospital. And let me tell you, If you didn't see it in this 1,200-bed psychiatric hospital, it did not exist. I promise you, if there was a pathology known to man, it was in this 1,200-bed psychiatric hospital. I've been in this profession now for almost 50 years, and I don't think I've seen anything that was not at some point during that year in that hospital. Schizophrenics, delusions, hallucinations, auditory, visual, whatever. I saw it all there. It was the best experience because it was all concentrated in one place, and you could spend years in the general population before you would have a chance to interact with those kinds of patients with that kind of pathology to get that kind of experience. But here, it was concentrated. They all came to you. And when I showed up down there, I was just there kind of, you know, working along. And then pretty soon, the director called me in there and said, well, you're the head intern. I said, what? 
uh, head intern, well, who did you turn down? I mean, are, are you kidding? I'm not sure I've got the right key to the building. And you talk about feeling like I was masquerading. Are you kidding me? I'm the head intern, which means I'm going to tell these other mutts what to do. I, I, and some of the psychiatrists there, English was like their third language. So I couldn't go ask them. They didn't speak English. Seriously, they didn't speak English. So I'm like, good Lord. And I really felt like I was rolling backwards down a hill. But then I looked around and thought, well, you know what? I don't feel like I know a whole lot. But as I look around, I think I probably know as much or more than any of these other people around here. So I better get busy and figure this out. And so I found some allies. I found some people that did speak English. I found some people that were really, really good clinicians. They weren't necessarily on my building, but they were at the hospital. And I went and found some allies, and I formed some relationships. And I remember one of them was a Dr. Cliff Canopy. He was a clinical director of the whole hospital. He didn't have anything to do with my building, but he was the big, big boss. He fortunately was one of the nicest guys ever. And I went over and struck up a relationship with him. He had written some papers and I read them. So I was conversant on the things he had written about. And I went over and started talking to him and formed a relationship and an alliance. And I could pick up the phone and call him and say, hey, I got a guy over here that's doing A, B, and C. And here's what his file says. Can you help me out? And he would say, sure, bring the file and come on over. And we would talk about it, and he would walk back over with me, and I'd sit down with this person, and he'd sit down with me. The director of the hospital would come over and sit down with me in a session with a single patient. He didn't ever do that. You know why he didn't ever do it? Because nobody ever asked him to. He was an administrator. Nobody ever asked him to because they thought the director doesn't do this. Well, I asked him. And he said, yeah, sure. So all of a sudden, I had an ally. I had a coach. I had a mentor. And he really started helping me. You have to say, okay, I'm going to make a plan, and that doesn't mean I'm going to be rigid. I'm going to keep my options open. Maybe I'm going to go down the path I think I'm going to go down on, but maybe I'm not. What I'm saying is be prepared to stretch. If you want to win in this world and you get rid of these toxic people, you're going to have a whole lot of energy that you didn't have before because it drains you to deal with these people that I asked you to make a list about. When you aren't being drained by these people, you're going to find you've got some extra time. You've got some extra energy. And we're going to talk next week about how to use that. So I'm telling you, decide who you are. Decide what your image is, and that image includes, I have the right to rid myself of people who suck me dry. I have the right to get people out of my life who don't wish me well. In-laws, friends, co-workers, whoever, that seem to sabotage me intentionally or otherwise, I have the right to get them out of my world and claim that right. Claim that right. And say, I don't have room for them in my life because I need room to star in my own life. I'm going to decide what it is that makes me unique and essential, and I am going to stretch to the next level because this is not a dress rehearsal. It is my time, it is my turn, and I'm going to take it. Now, this is why I've been talking to you about these toxic personalities in your life. I've been talking to you about them because I want you to be able to recognize them for who they are and what they are. I'm not asking you to decide they're evil people. I'm asking you to recognize they are not in your best interest and you are entitled to rid yourself of people that are not in your best interest. 
Maybe you rid yourself by removing them from your environment. Maybe you rid yourself by getting them into therapy. I don't know how you do it, but you have the right to do it. And that's what I am telling you I want you to claim. The first book I ever wrote was Life Strategies, and it had the 10 laws of life, and one of them was you have to name it to claim it. You have to name the right to rid yourself of people that don't have your best interest at heart, that don't have your best interest at heart, don't have your children's best interest at heart, don't have your family's best interest at heart. You have the right to get them out of your space. Maybe you do it because they get help. Maybe you do it because you just tell them they're not welcome. You don't have to be aggressive. You just be assertive. You just say, this is not working for me. I'm going to have to put up some boundaries here. We're not going to be able to spend any time together because it doesn't work for me and my family. So I'm going to exercise my right to put some distance between us. We'll revisit this at some time in the future if you would like. But for now, I'm going to claim my right to put some distance because it's not working for us in our life. I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying this doesn't work. And I claim the right to put some distance between us. And if they gaslight you and try to tell you it's your fault, say, okay, think about it however you want to think about it. But when we're through talking about it, I'm putting distance between us. Well, you don't care about me. Well, you have to label that however you want. But whenever we're through talking, which is going to be in five minutes because I have to go pick my children up, we're going to put some distance between us. I wish you nothing but the best. I hope you do me as well. But either way, we're going to put some distance between us. We can talk about this for five minutes or 30 minutes. That's where we're going to come down because I'm claiming that boundary. You have the right to do that. You don't have to yell and scream. In fact, it's not about yelling and screaming and gnashing of teeth. It's just about you calmly and confidently claiming your right to be who you are. That's why I said it's important that you know what your image is. Your image is, hey, I'm calmly claiming my space. I'm calmly claiming my right to be calm and in control. You know, I strongly believe that people know the truth when they hear it. I really do. I think you know you can have a con man coming at you and telling you A, B, C, and D. You can have me talking to you. I think people know the truth when they hear it. And I'm asking you right now, with what I'm telling you, am I telling you the truth? Just think about it. Does this have a ring of truth to it? I'm telling you, you don't have to judge these people. I'm telling you they're not evil. I'm telling you that you have the right if you claim the strength to claim the right to redefine yourself and redefine your relationships. And that's what I'm asking you to do. You deserve it. Remember me telling you that it's how you get borderline personalities or Antisocial personalities, people resistant to making a change. You don't tell them they need it. You tell them they deserve it. Well, I'm telling you, you deserve it. And I'm not telling you because I'm trying to get you to go into treatment. I'm telling you because I want you to claim your right in this life. Your right in this life to be surrounded by people that support your dreams that support your desire to succeed as a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter, that wants to see your family do well and succeed. You are entitled to that. You have to step up and claim that. And I want you to do that. So what I want you to do between now and when we talk next Tuesday, and you may want to show up with a pen and a pad. Maybe you want to show up with your computer, however you take notes. 
But you're going to want to write some things down next week because I'm going to give you an action plan with an eye towards making it the most efficient, most productive year of your life. I'm going to tell you one thing you can do that a lot of experts suggest you can improve your efficiency by 40% if you just do this one thing I tell you. Think about what I just said. Bold statement that you can improve your efficiency at a brain level by 40% if you embrace one thing I'm going to tell you. Now, if I were you, I'd show up for that. 40% is a pretty big deal. Think about what we've talked about. And as I've said, I want you to find one person you love and ask them to subscribe to this podcast and go back and start at the beginning of this series. Don't have them start here because they need to hear the first parts of these toxic personalities for this to really resonate with them. If they're going to start here, just don't even tell them. And this is going to sound kind of odd, But if it's somebody that you're competing with in your life, I don't think I would tell them to listen to this series because I believe this gives you a significant edge in life. And I don't think you want to show the other team your playbook. I'll see you next Tuesday. Be safe. Take care.